All right, well, why don't we get started? Um, I want to welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I am absolutely delighted today to have our um, special outside guest speaker, Dr. Luzio Perez Estable, um, who is the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH. Um, the uh, Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparity is focused on advancing the science of minority health and health disparities through research, training, increasing our research capacity, education, and dissemination of information. So Dr. Perez Estable was born in Cuba and then uh, raised in Pittsburgh, if I'm uh, have my sources are correct, yes. uh, and then spent almost 40 years at UCSF uh, where he rose to the rank of professor of medicine and led the division of general internal medicine uh, for a number of years. Uh, while there, he um, it developed a research program focused on improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved populations, advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among clinicians, and importantly, promoting the diversity of the um, workforce. Um, he's also been heavily focused on uh, research in Latino smoking cessation and prevention issues related to cancer screening, and has been an outstanding mentor to many minority investigators. He is extremely well published, and in recognition of his outstanding contributions to science, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2001. Um, and so I am absolutely delighted that um, he's accepted our invitation. Um, he is also going to be doing a um, small roundtable later on for our uh, members of our task force on DEI and other uh, junior investigators interested in healthcare disparities. Um, so I want to thank him again for that. And with that, I uh, will turn it over to uh, Dr. Elisio Perez Estable to talk about promoting health equity in the time of COVID-19. Thank you very much, you Lynn. So much. And uh, thank you so much for this invitation. I, I think I can say uh, safely that um, in the virtual world, uh, one has to uh, take care of how many invitations you can accept, because before it was travel and, li and you limited how long, how often you could travel. Um, but uh, I'm delighted to be able to uh, to present to this group. Everyone can see my slides, okay? Okay, perfect. Yep, we can see them. Great. All right. So over the next 45 minutes or so, I will want to take you through a tour of minority health health disparities. Um, obviously, I'm not going to cover nearly everything, but uh, I think that uh, you'll get a flavor for the kinds of things that our institute works on. Uh, we'll also talk about COVID and hopefully leave a little bit of time. Uh, for uh, questions at the end. So I will start with uh, some basic definitions, operational definitions that we use at NIH uh, on population with health disparities. NMHD was formed by congressional action in the year 2000 as a center, and then as part of the ACA became an institute in 2010. Uh, and the first three bullets listed here, racial ethnic minorities as defined by the census, less privileged socioeconomic status or poor people of any color, uh, underserved rural residents um, were, were in our legislation as populations with health disparities that we needed to do research on. In 2016, after a, a several year process that NIH underwent that I came in at the, in the last year, uh, sexual and gender minorities were declared a uh, population with health disparities um, for NIH research purposes. There are other groups that people uh, propose, but the, the, this is what we have agreed on so far, and the future may change. Uh, and so a health outcome that is worse in one of these groups in comparison to a referent group uh, defines a health disparity. And I say that because people use disparities um, in language differently. Uh, differences are, all differences are not disparities. Um, and there are groups with, populate, with populations with health disparities that actually do better in some things, and, and that has something that needs to be uh, determined by data. But a unifying factor amongst all these groups, in our view, is a social disadvantage that results in part from being subject to discrimination or racism, and that unifies these groups. And in addition to that, being underserved in healthcare. 
Now, these are the uh, census categories for race and ethnic groups. This is the terminology used by the census, so we adhere to this as much as, uh, as we can. African American or Black, so it's a choice. Asian, uh, which uh, is a problem because it's geographically defined, and yet South Asians, people from India and the subcontinent, are really different and probably should be a separate ethnic group in my view. And Western Asians, people from Iran and, and Middle East, are generally classified as white, so it's not strictly geographic. So um, uh, that, that is what it, it is what it is with the census. American Indians or Alaska Natives make up about 2% of the U.S. population. Native Hawaiians or other Pacific Islanders are about 1% of the U.S. population are most frequently lumped in with Asians, and that is wrong, flat out wrong. Um, and, because, and it's important to differentiate because this population group has much worse health outcomes than Asian Americans as a whole. Um, then whites, which uh, include people from Europe, as well as the Middle East and North Africa, and the proposal by the census to create a, an ethnic group called MENA, or Middle Eastern North African, for the 2020 census uh, was not approved by the administration. Uh, and so we, we stayed with, the, with this category, and maybe in the, in the next census that will happen. Uh, the, the category of more than one race, you all have a choice to, to check that box which in 2010 was 2.6% only. Uh, we'll see what it is in 2020. Uh, I would expect it to be higher. Um, and, uh, and we do know that it's almost certainly higher, but remember, uh, this is a self-identity social construct. And so that's what people are, they identify with one group or another. And then Latino or Hispanics, which is the only ethnic group uh, recognized by the census, um, and I'm, I belong to that one, uh, and it includes 20 countries from Latin America, and it is defined uh, um, by mixture of Europe, indigenous people, and Africa, with some uh, sprinkles of uh, Asia as well, East Asia as well. Now, <clears throat> why does race matter? Uh, that I have gotten that question, not recently, but certainly at different times at NIH. This is one simple answer that predicts things that we don't understand. Uh, now, life expectancy between whites and blacks, uh, the difference of four years for uh, three years for women, uh, you could uh, argue is explained fully by socioeconomic status, but it is not. And more detailed uh, exams of higher socioeconomic status African Americans defined by education show gaps that are similar uh, in terms of uh, health outcomes and, and life expectancy. So there is more here than just simple social class, which is was the uh, public health paradigm up until the early 1980s, I would say, on this topic. And then to make things even more complicated, Latinos or Hispanics live longer than whites, um, both for men and women. And if you look at the curves, they look more like uh, Germany than they do the United States. Uh, now, you ask about other groups, uh, Asians, uh, estimates have not been published by the CDC, but when they are published, they'll be like Latinos, the, the large group of Asians. American Indians and Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders have been examined in smaller studies, and CDC has published, um, not in uh, peer review literature, uh, some uh, reports on that, and they are worse than African Americans, both groups, uh, by a considerable number of years. Uh, so there's more work to be done in this area. Some share other aspects of mortality, and I'm not emphasizing that mortality is everything, but this is one uh, outcome that is um, unequivocal. Um, and in adults 25 to 44, we've seen over the last several years, and they have flattened a little bit recently, um, and 18 data are just out, so this is not updated with that, that um, mortality has increased um, for whites initially, and then subsequently for both Blacks and Latinos, and felt to be due primarily to the opioid uh, um, overuse epidemic. Um, the uh, alcohol and uh, suicide are also contributing, and people talk about the diseases of despair, although uh, there's controversy around that. But on the right side is good news. Um, the disparity in mortality between Blacks and whites uh, has been eliminated we, uh, once uh, an African American reaches the age of 65. This is um, a lot to do with wi uh, black women doing better, but also men. Uh, and there is also the, 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 the detail that Medicare kicks in at age 65, so that may have something to do with it as well. Or, or African Americans who make it to 65 
even if they're they have more chronic conditions are, are survivors and will do better. So, um, and you notice again that uh, Hispanics are, are better. Now, here's an, just an example of where the minority groups actually do better, except for American Indians and whites. This is uh, suicide rates uh, through 2015 compared to, to 15 years earlier. You see an increase for whites and American Indians. That's really quite concerning and dramatic, particularly for the American Indian population. Uh, and yet for African Americans, it's not. Uh, for Asian Pacific Islanders and Latinos, maybe slightly, uh, you know, it's fairly flat as well. So again, not explained uh, fully. It's not because there are other uh, things that are misclassified here. There's some misclassification here, but that would bias these findings to the null. So I do think these are real. And again, we don't know why this is found, uh, and it's something that uh, needs research. Now, one of my um, main issues at NIH, uh, and I've been repeating this every time eventually people listen, is to consider race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status is really fundamental in determining health. So think of them as blood pressure, body weight, uh, whether someone smokes or not, um, or has diabetes or not, or blood sugar, which is actually linearly correlated with outcomes. Um, uh, and, and yet, and we don't measure it in a reliable, systematic way. We do better with race, ethnicity for a variety of reasons, but not with socioeconomic status. And it explains a lot uh, that is not fully understood. Other examples uh, shown here, uh, African Americans have more strokes when compared to whites. This is uh, data from the REGARD study, a large cohort study um, uh, funded by NIH. And for the same level of blood pressure, an African American of 140 to 159, so what we used to call um, mild hypertension or stage one hypertension, uh, the risk of a stroke developing is double that of a white person over an observational period uh, in that cohort study. And these were adults less than 65 years of age. Um, most chronic diseases are generally more common in persons of less privileged socioeconomic status. There are a couple exceptions, like um, maybe uh, breast cancer is, uh, incidence is higher, but most chronic diseases are actually more common. And then persons with diabetes in an in a, a important study done out of Kaiser years ago from a registry, so where healthcare access more or less even all racial ethnic minority groups all had higher rates of diabetes than compared to whites. They all had less heart disease, less heart attacks after 10 years of follow-up, uh, and more end-stage renal disease. Uh, and why is that? Now, uh, I don't think anyone has an answer to that, but for the discovery science perspective, it's uh, an area to be examined. And I, there are some hypotheses that we could get into if people are interested. Now, uh, socioeconomic status, um, so uh, the easiest way to measure it, I think, is education. I'll talk about that. But this is data from um, the I, linking IRS uh, in, with the National Death Index data from Social Security. And this is from 2016. Raj Chetty published an influential paper several years ago in JAMA using these data. And essentially, if you're poor, so uh, an income of less than $25,000 a year for a household of four is roughly the U.S. poverty level, uh, you're three times more likely to die from anything, overall mortality, than if your household income is $115,000 for a household of four. And mind you, this group not, is definitely well off, or okay, let's put it that way, not wealthy, and yet would be receiving uh, uh, supplemental uh, support if um, the latest uh, uh, relief package was approved in Congress, just to give you a, a sense of where the spectrum of socioeconomic status lives. The median income in the U.S. is roughly $62,000, $64,000 pre-COVID uh, recession. Um, and as we know now from the economics of this past year, um, people in the upper end of income have actually uh, recovered all their potential losses and, if, any, if anything, done better. Um, and it's the poor people and the working class that have really could not recovered and probably won't recover for years to come. Now, how do you assess socioeconomic status? Uh, I, I would repeat and emphasize that simply knowing formal years of education uh, and using that in your clinical care of patients and definitely in any clinical research, clinical meaning anything with human beings, is important. Uh, and a high school diploma is different than a GED. Actually, CDC has published a number of uh, surveys showing that in behavioral aspects, you know, whether it be smoking or body weight uh, or alcohol. 
Income is trickier because uh, people are sensitive about income and underreporting is uh, up to 20% at both ends. And it's, you, you have to get the complication of dollars divided by number of dependents. There are good data sources to do this research wise, but it's harder to do in the, in the clinical context. The Whitehall study from uh, the UK, which was a classic study, um, my, Michael Marmot, among others, was uh, one of the leads on it um, uh, that, that showed this gradient of social class and, and health, both morbidity and mortality, uh, can also be used, although it's more complicated, there's just more categories and we have to agree on the categories. Uh, the life course is important. So let's, let's say you have um, two patients in the office. One, both are cardiologists. Uh, one is the first person in his or her family to go to college. Um, and, and the other is, you know, a third generation homeowner in San Francisco where I live for a long time and property prices have doubled essentially every decade. Um, so, in the one who's the first person to go to college, uh, same income, same prestige, same occupation, uh, same education, um, <clears throat> uh, and yet there's more wealth in one person than the other. We rarely uh, are able to appreciate that or do that in a clinical setting and even in a research setting. So, just uh, keep in mind that these measures are limited uh, and, and to get more uh, in depth, you have to do more, more questioning about it. Uh, parental education is used with children. And then there is a simple answer that would, would be done with data science, which is to impute the census tract uh, the, the, from the American Community Survey, the median income or education into everyone's record and, to, and into every research participant. If you have the exact address, you can do this very accurately because it's a census tract. If you have a zip code, it won't be as accurate, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> Now, I don't pretend for you to think that it's all about social economic status. There are many other social determinants of health. Uh, I won't go through this list. These are individual social determinants. People are now more sensitized to things like health literacy and food security. Uh, health numeracy is another one that has been understudied. Um, I've done work in language uh, access and, and uh, I have a couple of slides at the, towards the end of the talk on this on this topic. But these are all potentially relevant depending on on your population. Less studied and less measured are the structural social determinants of health as we have labeled. Um, and these are things like access to affordable housing um, uh, with basic uh, needs, uh, green space, which matters and sidewalks so you can actually walk safely in your neighborhood. Uh, issues around public safety and criminal justice are really important um and how we interact with the criminal justice system it's very variable based on socioeconomic status uh access to broadband has become a critical part it's like electricity now i i think and yet we continue to um uh have very unequal distribution there in terms of types of plans and access and this is affecting our children uh, in the past year as education has been virtual in much of the country um, and continues to be for the for the time being and other factors here. Um, much of this is driven, uh, as I'll, I'll talk about, uh, residential segregation has been the vehicle by which some of these factors have deteriorated um, and, uh, and, the, and the policy that has impacted us in terms of racism. Now, at NMHD, we embarked on a project a couple of years ago to try and get common data elements for social determinants of health. Uh, I was um, bent on wanting us to do um, similar measures or exact same measures or have a, a menu of measures that we could all point to and say, these have been vetted by science. Uh, we'd like everyone to use them. And I could say that about the census uh, questions on race, ethnicity, or some socioeconomic status questions used by the National Health Interview Survey, for example, but really try and develop these for the structural determinants. We, we had our first launch in May. Um, you can find it on the National Library of Medicine website, but if you just uh, Google the, the Phoenix uh, Toolkit uh, website, you'll find this. Um, and we're continuing to work on these uh, with an uh, ongoing work group uh, at, within NIMHC, and then we have a, a wider group at NIH uh, that, that will vet these and eventually get a, a, a national panel of experts to, uh, to review them. Um, this is our research framework that we established in, um, uh, that we developed in 2016, 2017. Uh, staff did this uh, on my prompting. We, I had done some work on this at the National Institute on Aging when I was on their council prior to moving to NIH. Um, and uh, this is not meant to be comprehensive or causal, 
it's not a, a model of causation. It's really just a roadmap, uh, if you wish, a menu by which uh, an investigator can say, well, my work is over here or over there. Um, in portfolio analysis of what NMHD funds, we still are mostly living in this space, the individual um, levels of influence. We have, we have grants across the board, but it's not as um, dispersed as I would like to see it. Uh, hopefully as our budget grows, we can, uh, we can expand uh, in those categories. So let me pivot to COVID-19, which has consumed probably 90% of my time since uh, March 15th of uh, 2020. Uh, and I say that not, not uh, in jest, um, uh, it really has been uh, an all government effort and certainly an all NIH effort. Late March, uh, Dr. Fauci in one of those uh, you know, famous press briefings that he was doing uh, with uh, President Trump at the time, um, uh, talked about the, the, how hard hit the African-American community had been by COVID-19. And I must say that none of us, I think, or at least I wasn't at all, uh, expecting or predicting that the pandemic would uh, just shine this uh, light on uh, health disparities in the way it did as a consequence of the uh, social inequalities in, in the U.S. And um, with my uh, brand new deputy, Monica Webb Hooper, we published in Scientific Director uh, in Annapolis, we published a perspective in JAMA uh, in early May uh, on this aspect. And I would say emphasize that uh, since May until now, almost February, nothing has changed in terms of the epidemiology. Over 50% of cases and almost half of the mortality is in Latinos, American Indians, or African Americans. And if you throw in Pacific Islanders, it gets a little higher. We represent about a third of the US population. So you can see this is a huge gap. This is not a slight disparity, it's huge. And the big issue here is rates of infection. A lot was made early on. Oh, um, there's a lot more obesity and a lot more diabetes. And so you, that's why you're seeing this. Well, the reality is that the underlying cause is due to the longstanding disadvantage and disparities, high proportion of public facing jobs. I mean, uh, at least in my environment, if you go to the supermarket, who, who's, who's, who's at the cash register? Uh, if you go to the pharmacy, who's driving the buses? Who's doing construction work? Um, who has to leave their home to earn a living. Um, and it's not me and it's not us. Well, uh, clinicians do, of course, and so do uh, bench scientists. But I'm saying that the disproportionate representation in these public facing jobs is part, a large part of the cause. The other is crowding and housing. Uh, it's not uncommon for families uh, either to have uh, three generations under one roof or, um, or two families sharing a home in urban settings where um, minorities are disproportionately represented. And in the areas of town that they live, they, they tend to be more crowded, you know, more buildings and, and, um, and, and more apartments as opposed to uh, single family homes with yards and separation. Um, and that's at least the reality I see here in the District of Columbia and the surrounding neighborhoods. There is a higher rate of comorbid conditions, less access to healthcare, so you would expect uh, people presenting with more advanced disease and having perhaps more severe disease from COVID uh, and higher mortality. We've learned to treat COVID um, with what we have, uh, so the mortality is being managed better, but this is uh, not the only reason we're seeing. So it is a, it is a priority to address this. These are data from June of uh, 2020 that the CDC published uh, last summer. They're looking at the hotspots back then, 22 states, mostly in the Sun Belt, and you see the difference in rates of infection by ratio, you know, varying, you know, from two to, to eight uh, times uh, among these different minority groups. And in the case of Latinos, uh, African-Americans and, Hawaii and uh, Native Hawaiians are a lot of counties to examine. So the sample size was pretty robust. Also early data from the pandemic, who was delaying care? Now routine care was being delayed by everybody. Hopefully that's uh, now uh, uh, at least decreased uh, significantly. But urgent care was being disproportionately delayed by African Americans and Latinos um, for perhaps different reasons. Uh, and that's something that uh, would lead to more severe consequences of COVID. And these are more recent analysis of mortality ratios uh, with uh, age adjustment. And you see that for indigenous or American Indians, Latinos, uh, African Americans, and Pacific Islanders, the mortality ratio remains you know, two to three times higher compared to both Asians and whites in these data. Uh, so uh, keep this in mind as we think about COVID. 
This is a model study that came out of the British Medical Journal Open, uh, again, showing that the probability of getting SARS-CoV-2 infection, PCR positive in African-Americans compared to whites uh, goes up and it goes up even with increasing risk with age. And the same is true for Latinos. So the evidence is compelling that this is a disproportionate uh, burden uh, and it has had a disproportionate effects on mortality. So what did the NIH respond? So, <clears throat> you know, initially I thought, well, COVID is really in the infectious disease, vaccine development, therapeutics. And, uh, but in, in, in answering the call, we understood early on that there were social, behavioral, and economic consequences of the pandemic that needed research. And with the uh, National Institute on Mental Health, National Institute on Aging, and the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, uh, we formed the coalition, pulled some money with support from the built from our uh, uh, director, from the uh, the office of the director, funded 52 uh, supplements to existing grants, and through this pooled effort, uh, plus uh, there were a number of other supplements funded by different institutes. We funded a total of 36, uh, aging funded over 50, and mental health about another dozen, and and so forth, and really to complement. specific to COVID. Our um, intramural program launched an internet survey that uh, will hopefully shed some light uh, with uh, stratified by uh, race, ethnicity, and geography. Uh, there were also a call for digital and community engaged interventions. We now have formal R01s that will hopefully be funded, just a few, because we don't, the, the R01s are more expensive, but uh, we hope to move on that direction. And also how behavioral biological mechanisms may contribute to manifestations. Um, we have two ongoing uh, large data studies, one through the National Council of Economic um, uh, Researchers. I think they're based in, in Harvard or MIT um, that uh, National Institute on Aging has an ongoing contract with them. And, and they've been looking at them, monitoring what the impact on the country is. And then the uh, Institute for Health Metric Evaluation at the University of Washington we, we funded them um, through an MHD uh, to do extra uh, COVID analysis on morbidity, mortality, particularly within a lens in the US with uh, race, ethnicity. Uh, and our focus has been, the unified focus has been on populations with health disparities and social or, or uh, medical vulnerabilities. <clears throat> but we didn't stop there. Uh, Congress uh, allocated an extra billion and a half dollars to NIH in early April of 2020. Much of it was for, all of it was for testing. Some of it was allocated for serology. Some of it was for new tests. And uh, there are now um, uh, new methods and tests in both PCR, um, uh, lateral flow assays, uh, home tests are available now from, from the company named Illum. And there's more coming <clears throat> uh, that are, you know, pending um, uh, emergency use authorization by the FDA. But, uh, Dr. Collins allocated $500 million uh, for this program, what we call RADx UP, ra Radical Acceleration of Diagnostics for Underserved Populations. Um, he asked me and uh, Dr. Hodes from Aging and uh, Dr. Tara Schwetz, who is the Deputy Director, uh, Deputy Associate Director for the whole NIH, uh, to co lead this. Uh, and in the course of a few months, we stood up and funded 53 testing intervention projects in 33 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, and an additional 16 research studies were funded. We call these as social, ethical, and behavioral research. Um, and then a large coordination and data collection center at Duke University of North Carolina. That was the only new grant. Uh, all were competitively reviewed uh, at NIH. Um, and the, uh, this uh, coordinating center is, uh, is being uh, managed by the NIMHD. Um, and, uh, and this is really to accelerate um, the implementation science, amplify and disseminate best practices, and, uh, and really uh, test strategies to reduce disparities. So the goal is to promote testing in, in all these populations that were disproportionately affected. And most of the studies are focused on one or another ethnic group, sometimes multiple ethnic groups, sometimes elderly, older adults, sometimes there are even half a dozen studies on children and adolescents. Uh, one or two on pregnant women. So it's a broad spectrum of an, an incarcerated or post-incarcerated individuals. Um, and uh, the CDCC, as we call it, the Coordination and Data Collection Center, uh, is trying to 
uh, keep track of all of these. So uh, they have a big charge for us. But the goal is, what can we learn to reduce disparities? Of course, the question in uh, August, September, when we funded the first phase in November, have changed because now we have a vaccine. This is a map of the, the awards. You can see we got most of the countries. Uh, we even got Medical College of Wisconsin there. Sorry, uh, guys. Um, but uh, you see Montana State University, we, we got Hawaii, we, we funded Puerto Rico. Uh, there are about seven projects that are um, involving American Indians, including a grant to the Cherokee Nation So um, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, but now we have this uh, challenge of the vaccine, right? Or the opportunity of the vaccine, I should say. And in the in the summer, um, we realized that the two first trials that were being done, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, uh, they went out and started recruiting. Now, NIH was not really engaged with Pfizer. They were on their own. Uh, they were subsidized by the government for production, but not in the conducting the study. But NIH was very much at the table with Moderna. And in fact, uh, um, the NIH provided Moderna with uh, the techniques, the technology to do the messenger RNA vaccine and have worked very closely with them. So beginning in um, sometime in July, we started having these Saturday morning calls uh, with uh, Dr. Gibbons and I and Dr. Collins and Dr. Fauci and the Surgeon General and Monse Slaoui uh, from uh, op formerly Operation Warp Speed and, uh, and the Moderna people, including their CEO, um, to talk about recruitment. They were starting off recruiting 90 plus percent of their participants were white. And, and slowly they did better. They ended up creating, you know, ending up with about 20% uh, Latino and about 11% African American. So I would say they got a C on recruitment for diversity or inclusive participation. They were very happy with it. Um, uh, and we were happy that they, it wasn't 90% white. Um, and the concern was what was the perception of the vaccine going to be if among, especially among the African American community, it had the highest level of mistrust if, um, if uh, the, the trial was only done in white, in white persons. Uh, so we stood up this program called Community Engagement Research Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities, literally um, willed the, by Dr. Collins with incredible effort on Dr. Gibbons and myself, uh, with some support from other institutes uh, to address this uh, incredible level of misinformation in communities. But it wasn't just for the vaccine trials. I think we have actually created an infrastructure of community engaged researchers uh, that can really, uh, hopefully we can maintain and everything is sort of uh, short term now because of COVID uh, and uh, accelerate the uptake of beneficial treatments and approaches to control of the epidemic and going to the communities through our funded investigators who have been doing this work for a couple of decades um, and, and telling them, uh, you know, we're not from the government and here to help you, the famous line. Uh, we're, 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 we're scientists and we're here to tell you the way things are and we want you to build trust in science. Um, and we gradually have been, I think, making progress based at least on the, on the initial uh, interactions through webinars. Uh, we've engaged the NAACP, the National Urban League, the National Medical Association, the National Hispanic Medical Association, Unidos Us. It's a full partnership with community based organizations and that's the way the 11 uh, current coalitions are, are created. I went, I knew a lot of these PIs or proposed PIs and I, I got them on, on WebEx early on and I said, look, this is not about your glory. This is not about research and publishing. This is about getting together and responding to this national emergency. We'll provide you with, you know, of course, not enough money. Everyone wants more money. But uh, we, we will do what we can to find the money. Uh, we need you to, 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 to leverage the capital you have built over years to really help our communities. And I think we've gotten a, a reasonably good response. And I think we're well positioned to hopefully expand this modestly um, as we're now into full, full mode vaccine uptake uh, um, emphasis. Um, these are data from uh, November. Uh, so Latinos and whites were similar in terms of willingness to take the vaccine. Asians are even more willing. African Americans were below 50%. Uh, there are some very disheartening reports of uh, if you go to healthcare settings, physicians are, are more likely to get the vaccine, you know, over 90%. It, there's a major drop off when you get to nursing staff. Uh, this is of concern. 
Uh, there are local reports here of uh, nursing home workers that sort of mostly staff, you know, medical assistants, uh, custodians declining the vaccine. Uh, so uh, we have work to do uh, on this. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, this will go on for most of this calendar year. Now, let me pivot the talk now to talk about other important things, not just, uh, and hopefully I'm not too behind on time. Uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes. So let me say a few things about racism. Um, so um, in thinking about this topic, uh, which has now become quite um, uh, popular to at least say everyone's anti-racist, and I'm not saying that facetiously, but uh, where, you know, I, part of me would say, where were you five years ago? Um, and, and, but I'm glad you're you're on board now, um, including uh, the NIH. We being part of government, we had some issues to deal with uh, because of the executive order that was uh, uh, published in September. But um, prior to that, and certainly now, we're, we're taking this on full board. Um, and I'm pleased to see many uh, institutions doing this as well. This is data from uh, 2015. You ask somebody in the past 30 days where you treated unfairly because of racial ethnic background in all of these settings, 53% of African Americans said yes. And mind you, this is the past 30 days. This is not in your life or in the last year, in the last 10 years. This is 30 days. So this is a real problem that goes on every day in the United States. Latinos are lower, but not, but certainly much higher than whites. Uh, and in healthcare, we do a lot better, as we should. Uh, but uh, it's also not uh, absent. Uh, and so I think the, the point is, the first point is recognize that this is a problem that we have not resolved because we had a black president or because we passed civil rights legislation 50 years ago. Now, as a research construct, I like to think of, uh, of racism in these categories. Almost all of the work has been done in interpersonal uh, racism or discrimination. This is uh, using scales, the everyday discrimination scale being the, perhaps the, the most vetted one. It's on our Phoenix Toolkit website. Um, and they're good. They've done a fair amount of research and associations have been established. Other constructs are, are either newer or harder to measure, internalized racism, uh, which is someone who says, no, I've never had problems with that, but they have internalized it cognitively or biologically. Uh, perceived societal discrimination, I'll show you a study that is, I think is an interesting construct to uh, do more work in, and then secondhand effects. Um, the overall, uh, the, the individual basis of racism measures have uh, uh, looked at physical and mental health status, particularly among African Americans. It conceptualized a form of cumulative chronic stress with long-term effects. Uh, so think of this as adverse childhood events. So if, if, if you grow up uh, in a racist environment or feeling discriminated, well, how did, what does that do to your health 30 or 40 years later? Sort of like uh, you lost a parent or you had an alcoholic uh, a parent or a single family home, or you were very poor and had food insecurity growing up. Uh, what does that do to your health at age 40? And that's the model that we think about in exposure to racism and discrimination. It's a cumulative chronic stress variety of uh, ways to try and evaluate this with physiological markers. And the associations with uh, cardiovascular reactivity, blood pressure has been uh, done for some years, as well as health behaviors, particularly substance use behavior, and some would say also um, overeating uh, and leading to um, obesity. But there's a lot less data on other disease outcomes. Well, how can we mitigate racism? Um, this, there's some ideas uh, that I extract from the literature, not a whole lot of empirical evidence on any of this, but um, uh, early, uh, early childhood support is really important. You could argue things like physical activity or uh, meditation, mindfulness, religiosity also help um, uh, mitigate the uh, stress, basically, is what you're doing. That's the model that we're working on. Uh, from a societal perspective, actually, the integration experiment, I like to call it, from the 60s and 70s was working before we abandoned it in 1980 or so, or after 1980. Um, uh, because if you look at the population health of African Americans compared to whites, and that's the only group that we have robust data on during that time, it was continuously improving uh, from the six, uh, throughout the 60s and 70s, um, and then sort of flattened and got worse throughout the 80s and into the mid 90s before it started to recover and improve gradually over the last 20 years has continued to improve. But it's a huge gap to make up. So one has to think this racial socialization does have an impact. It does. It just doesn't happen short term. 
Uh, I also think that cultural competence in patient-centered medical home can be a vehicle to improve this, as well as uh, other measures of, uh, that could work in the healthcare setting. But ultimately, we need to get the power and structure of institutions and policies that really are perpetuating this inequality. And I think that's the inflection point we're at now. We are examining this for the first time as academicians and as uh, a society. Uh, and I think uh, at least part of our society. And I think that's what makes it so different. At NIMHD, um, we've been talking about structural racism for some time. Uh, when I got to NIMHD, I, I said, is this a research construct or is it an organizational construct? We held a workshop in 2017 to think about this. We had experts come, we published, a, we had a summary report, it's on our website. Uh, but thinking of this as organized system that literally categorizes and ranks and devalues and disempowers parts of the population and differentially allocates resources. If you look at the history and how sociologists have uh, written about this, um, it started uh, systematically uh, in recent history in the 1930s. Uh, yes, under Franklin Roosevelt, uh, where the policies of, ra of racial um, uh, residential segregation were established and implemented and broadly implemented after World War II with the returning uh, veterans, you know, the access to inexpensive mortgages so people could buy homes and build equity, build wealth, uh, was differentiated by this redlining policy of not uh, making loans accessible to African-Americans. And if you have residential segregation, then you get um, deterioration of economic opportunity, schools get worse, uh, less, less transportation, criminal justice, safety uh, deteriorates. And I think that's uh, one of the root causes of this uh, that can be addressed, and, but it will be a challenge. Um, in our visioning uh, uh, supplement at American General Public Health, we also talk about this in the 30 strategies. Uh, some examples from the literature, um, Tom Labiste did this analysis in Brooklyn uh, many years ago, uh, looking at segregated white neighborhoods, integrated neighborhoods, and segregated black neighborhoods. Brooklyn lends itself for that. And you can see the, the, the proportion of liquor stores in low-income neighborhoods dramatically goes up in African-American neighborhoods. And in the high-income uh, segregated white or, or integrated or black, you see a gradient, although not as marked. So there are differences by socioeconomic and race. And this is why it's important to look at both. This is work from Elizabeth Howell in New York, uh, looking at maternal morbidity, severe maternal morbidity, um, and showed that in a low black serving hospital, sort of a proxy for perhaps a quote, higher quality hospital, African-American women actually had a lower severe, a rate of severe maternal morbidity than white women in the high black serving hospital. So that's telling me in part that it's not just about the women and what they bring and their pre-pregnancy um, uh, health status, but it's about the hospital, the structure. And so uh, I think this shone a light on, uh, on the structural uh, issues involved here. This is analysis uh, from SEER, um, uh, looking at uh, a large sample of women presenting with stage three breast cancer. And stage three breast cancer essentially is incurable and it's a, a missed uh, screening uh, of mammography. And you could say, well, sometimes biologically cancers are this way and, and grant you that. Uh, but in this analysis from SEER, very large sample, 20% of with Medicaid uninsured, the risk of stage three breast cancer was much higher in either the uninsured or Medicaid versus those who had, um, uh, quote unquote, better insurance. Uh, and then adjusted for insurance, you see, see a race difference. But half of the disparity was mediated by insurance. I would argue insurance, even that no access to insurance is a structural um, discrimination uh, policy uh, about, you know, because it disproportionately actually affects Latinos uh, and African-Americans. Uh, I also think that patient clinician communication is another area that is in part structural. Uh, we know that it is a powerful means of getting better health with patients. Uh, less malpractice suits on one hand has been shown, but also patients feel better when they feel that their doctor uh, listens to them uh, and lets them ask questions. Um, lots of qualitative data uh, to show this. Lisa Cooper did some elegant studies many years ago showing race concordant visits for African Americans were more patient centered. And similar studies have been done with language concordant patients in non English speaking Latino patients. Uh, the MEP study, the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey from HRQ, has shown that Black and Latino physicians care for over 50% of US minorities in that panel survey, which is representative. 
of people with access to healthcare. And uh, over 70% of those who are limited English proficient and disproportionately more people with Medicaid or uninsured. And, uh, and yet only about 10% of medical school graduates are from these groups and 10% of practicing physicians are underrepresented minorities. So to me, it says, well, we have evidence that one way of decreasing disparities is to train more minority docs, uh, especially black and Latino physicians or other underrepresented groups, including some Asian groups. Um, and yet it, we have enormous barriers to do that uh, that are mostly on the legal side and have prevented this from uh, being implemented. But there's evidence to say that this could work to provide more access. Um, it, we did an analysis I did with a post uh, fellow who is now a tenure track faculty uh, investigator at uh, NIMHD, uh, Shireen, of the HINTS data uh, on electronic health, acts, uh, health record and portal use and found that the race was not a predictor of, uh, of use of the portal. Once you get into the portal, which does have uh, other factors determining it, having a primary care clinician, having a higher level of education and women were associated with more portal use, but race was not. So I think this is, you know, again, try to address the issue. Oh, minorities won't use the portal. They're, they're much less likely to. It's really about uh, other factors uh, that are impacting. Let me quickly go through the issues around interpreters, um, uh, patients who use interpreters, and maybe in, Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, you have fewer non-English speaking patients, but they generally say less, uh, ask less and answer less, even with professional interpreters. Encounters, if you're using an interpreter, if you have ever you've done that, I'm sure most of you have, you, it, takes, it takes twice as long. You have three people talking, right? Um, but you, so you either have more time, which of course you don't in the clinic, uh, or you do half as much. Um, and you gen generally, you take care of the technical stuff. So you miss out on some of the relationship building of the, the strength of, uh, of a really patient clinician communication. And who translate really matters. Professional interpreters always should be required. It's a matter of quality and accuracy. Errors occur much more frequently in ad hoc or uh, you know, family interpreters. And there's technology now to really make this more disseminated. I'll skip the frequency, but there are clinically significant errors that occur. And this is through a qualitative study we did in an internal medicine clinic in a hospital in the San Francisco Bay Area with faculty and residents uh, seeing patients. Uh, through interpreters. Uh, so um, pay attention to this. Uh, it, it's a matter of quality. And also in the hospital, although uh, it's a, we, we didn't do this kind of qualitative study, the policy implications there are that systems, health systems to do this. They need to uh, invest in supporting access to language services. And you can do it through uh, technology, the better, either video interpretation in the clinic or even a basic dual handset telephone in the hospital. Will, will be effective. Doctors uh, need to have more time for interpreter-mediated visits. Uh, it just takes longer, maybe not uh, 40 minutes, but you could do 30-minute visits uh, in order to provide similar quality of care. And, and then if you have language skills for clinicians in, in your area, they should be evaluated, formally tested, um, uh, and recognized with added compensation because you're actually saving the system money if you're committed to quality of care um, and you're providing better care uh, for the patient, there's empirical evidence, again, to support this. Um, I talked about this already, so I'm going to not dwell on it as I wind down. But keep in mind that treating hypertension, we know what to do, and yet we don't do it as well as we should. Um, and the, the national data show in Medicare that African Americans, even though I just told you they have worse outcomes and you, everyone knows they have more rates, higher rates of hypertension, are less likely to have their blood pressure control. The easy answer people have is, oh, it's poor adherence, uh, and that's not acceptable. Uh, it's a system issue. And Kaiser showed that with, and Kaiser takes care of poor people too, working poor. Uh, over 80% of patients can be controlled with this multi-level interventions uh, with the doctors, the patients, the system, and the nurses in, 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 the, in the practice. Um, and they used ACE and thiazide, so they weren't using rocket science new drugs. So how do we promote health equity to reduce disparities? Expanding access is one initial step. This consensus on what to do, what could be prenatal care for pregnancy, or it could be diabetes control, or it could be a variety of other things that we could, we could uh, you could list there. Coordination of care, I think, has a lot of promise, not as much empirical evidence that it can uh, do better quality. There's some evidence that recently was published about better 
uh, decrease hospitalizations when you have teams taking care of patients. Um, Patient-centered care, I think, again, increasing evidence uh, that primary care does save lives, and this is an effective way of organizing healthcare. And then leveraging IT and the health, electronic health record, not her, uh, to address equity, I think, will be an important uh, part. I think that we're moving slowly towards the idea of creating an equity quality measure to make uh, systems accountable on that basis. Because if you put money on the table and say, okay, performance outcomes, if you do better, uh, you'll get, you'll get a, a bonus. If you do worse, you'll get a penalty. And, and Medicare has moved in this direction. And they've been trying this with some things uh, like uh, total knee replacements. There's empirical evidence that uh, safety net hospitals will end up doing worse. And who can do, what safety net hospital could use uh, getting more penalties and, and fewer bonuses on that basis? We also think that this community engaged model has finally um, gotten traction at NIH, and I think it's a it's an, an outstanding way of thinking about research. It's not short term; it's long term. Uh, it's really uh, important that we think about shifting the model of care, uh, healthcare, to a population health model, um, as opposed to the way it's organized uh, in most parts of the eastern the United States. To recognize the importance of health. Uh, Sandro Galea, a, a colleague and a dean at School of Public Health in Boston, talks about health being like uh, um, a soccer team, a football team in international terms. Uh, health care is the goalie. If you have a great goalie, you, you, you won't be scored against. But we have forgotten about the other, uh, the other, the other players uh, uh, because uh, health really happens out there and not in the health care system. Uh, and this involves, you know, food, safety, transportation, uh, good jobs so people can, or reasonable jobs so people can uh, can take care of themselves. And then managing this whole issue of structural uh, discrimination is important. And MHD's agenda includes multi-level interventions. I think we we are we we we've been very open about this. Not the only thing we fund. We are interested in discovery science and mechanisms on both the biological uh, and behavioral side, as well as how this in interacts with social determinants. Uh, I, I hope that we'll do more on specific communication strategies between patients and clinicians. Uh, we've cleared a concept on this at our council and uh, we'll be looking to publish a funding opportunity announcement later this year. And then implementing structural change to modify individual and group behaviors, I think, can work. And uh, it is uh, often a side of sort of people, uh, researchers observe it as part of their study and they, oh, isn't this interesting? Um, but it, it's something that we should be more uh intent intentional on in planning interventions so i'll stop there um i uh, showed you the ajph and this is how to get in contact with us uh lynn you can have my slides um and distribute them if people want them um, uh, thank you for your attention great I'll stop stop sharing i hope yeah there we go come on excellent well thank you for a comprehensive sobering but yet optimistic presentation um hope for the future um and uh can you comment on tr the efforts or best practices to trying to increase medical school admissions for uh urms um well there's actually some encouraging work uh, and this is the the holistic approach of uh, evaluating admission so if you if you put it into into a formula and saying, well, like UCSF used to do. Uh, well, I was on this school admissions committee in the early 90s for uh, three years. Um, and so if you didn't go to a certain school and you didn't get an MCAT score above a certain level or have a GPA in science, uh, you were going to be automatically triaged out. Now, back then, um, uh, we were able to have a sort of a uh, a, a, uh, an underrepresented or disadvantaged subcommittee. So we would look at candidates who self-identified as that, um, whether for socioeconomic reasons or disability or, or race ethnicity, and then we would evaluate them separately. We still were looking for people who were going to survive at UCSF, mind you. Uh, and I think that was working. And that was illegal because of the Supreme Court decisions uh, and, and med schools have gotten uh, other ways of doing it. Davis did this thing where looking at where people live. So be able to select students uh, on the basis of coming from disadvantaged areas uh, based on census uh, data. And that worked uh, reasonably well. Um, and the other is this holistic approach. So to be a doctor, you, we know this. You know, the, the, being really smart is 
good, but it's not the only ingredient that matters. And so that has gotten more traction both in med school and in residency. And certainly in residency, we have, um, I was very involved all the way till 2015 in residency selection for our primary care track. So um, I, I think that that approach has been very effective. It has not been applied as much in the biomedical, you know, PhD science world. And I think uh, there's efforts to try and move in that direction. So. Great. And there's been a lot of um, discussion about the inclusion of race in um, various parameters. For example, uh, the inclusion of race in estimating your GFR and how that impacts uh, your eligibility for transplant, inclusion of race in the standards for pulmonary function tests and lung volumes. Um, but, and so there's a lot of pushback on including race. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Right. No, that's a, a really important question. I, first, my my uh, not acceptable disclaimer is that I haven't delved into that controversy uh, full board yet. My initial reaction was that it, that uh, empirical work needed to be done in these areas, and if the empirical association showed differences, it wasn't racist. It was it was a, a scientific observation. Now. If you go back and look at the GFR data, it was based on very inadequate data. And so I think you could argue that that was probably not an appropriate way of evaluating it. If you look at the pulmonary function test data, it was done, it was analysis done from a very robust data. So uh, if this is a true difference, um, I think the scientists would say, well, let's, uh, let, let's see how we incorporate it. So, I, I think I, I fall. I have to fall somewhere in between. I'm not going to automatically dismiss this as an approach, and I'm certainly not in favor of dismissing, including race. There has also been a, a general acceptance in medical school. I would say that we don't talk about race when you talk about clinical cases because uh, there were data that people were biased. They say, "Oh, this." They only talked about a, a, an African American patient when they were a drug user or. Uh, or homeless, or that kind of thing, and they and they would rarely uh, use uh, the terminology uh, in defining uh, people who were, um, you know, better off. Uh, and my, you know, when I was on the wards, I would always role model that as well as part of as part of knowing the patient, who they are, and where they come from. So I always talk about it. In fact, I I, I use it in my first line in describing. Tell me first about the person. Uh, not about their disease or their symptoms. And that includes socioeconomic background. That was, uh, I remember a case we had on a Sunday morning in, uh, in Moffitt, they had admitted the day before, and it was a patient with uh, lymphoma and a pleural effusion and whatever. And and uh, when I went to talk to him, I said, well, what do you do for a living? He's an uh, older white man. And he goes, oh, I'm retired. Well, what did you used to do? Oh, uh, I, I, I was uh, a sociologist, uh, and, and he turned out that he was a, actually, a, he used to study doctors. Uh, and he was an academician, retired. Residents had no clue. They had no idea. Um, and, and of course, he probably, you know, he's sick and, and not, not doing well, so he, he probably wasn't the most chatty person. But I think these are the kinds of things you need, or talking to someone who doesn't know how to read and people don't, not knowing it. So I, I do think it's important. Uh, I, I think there is an in-between ground. I've had some conversations with Neil Poe and others about this. And so, uh, but I, I have to formulate a position on this, particularly when I talk to uh, my clinical uh, colleagues. So thank you for that question. Okay, um, there's a couple of questions, only a few minutes le left. Um, so in terms of training faculty uh, to mitigate implicit bias, um, have do you have specific uh, recommendations or best practices again um, for the most effective way um, to train our faculty? Um, you know, my view on the implicit bias is that it's a good tool uh, to um, uh, to basically uh, raise awareness. Um, uh, we all have biases, and 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 to assume that oh no, you're not biased, oh I'm not a racist. No one's trying to say you're a racist and it's, you know, with some blatant, obvious things that we hear. But um, and I think in healthcare, most people are honestly uh, not intending to be discriminatory. But we all bring these biases to from our early life, and, uh, and your discomfort with different types of people is real. And and professionally, 
you learn, well, we need to overcome this. And fortunately, our brains are very powerful organs and cognitively you can do it. And I think that's what the implicit bias does. It, it, it tests it, it shows you where you might have some, some, some issues. Uh, and then you can you can really uh, click on that. And that, it works not as a solo exercise. I, I don't think how effective it can be that way. But it works when you do it and then you talk about it and you have some moderator facilitator helping you in, in thinking about it. Um, will it change behavior? I don't know. I think there are some efforts and there's very little data actually on this. Uh, there's some efforts with medical students and uh, the results aren't, um, aren't totally negative, but they're not uh, as good as maybe you, you would like. The students are influenced a lot by role models. And so what they see from their attendings on the wards, their initial clinical experiences really impacts them. Uh, and that, that seems to matter as much as anything else uh, in terms of, uh, but making people sensitive, uh, you know, promoting emotional intelligence, making people aware of these issues so that they develop insights and strategies and how to manage their own clinical world. I mean, no, you walk into a hospital room and a patient starts uh, using foul language and saying, get out of here, I don't want to see you. I mean, no one likes that. But what's your reaction going to be? Uh, walk out of the room and say, okay, they don't want to see me, bye, uh, you know, or, or try to do the best you can to take care of them. And, and you know, that's the, that's the reality that we sometimes have to face in, as, as clinicians. It comes with the territory, as they say. Well, thank you. We're just about out of time. Um, I will um, have one final question uh, and also comment that I put your email in the chat. It yes, is publicly please. available, so uh, you can also search on the web um, for it, which is how I found it. Um, and no, this it, it, uh, presentation is being recorded and will be posted so um, we can share with, with others. Um, do you want to comment on the budget of um, uh, your your institute compared to others and uh, within the age and thoughts on that? Well, I, first I'll say that in, 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 uh, in NIH, everyone gets a budget from Congress, so we, we generally don't fight about money because <laughs> it's all written in, in, the, in, the, in the congressional, uh, in the law, in the omnibus bill that they passed. Um, NIMHD has this year increased uh, to $390 million. Um, uh, much of that increase was targeted for a new program that Congress charges to develop on uh, chronic diseases, uh, more than one at once. Uh, and they mandated us to collaborate with other institutes and to make these regional. So um, we're working on the details of that. So we will be uh, having a, a, a funding opportunity announcement on this uh, soon, and we'll talk about it at our council next week. Um, but uh, we are the third uh, least funded group, if you wish. Uh, Fogarty has about 70 million. Uh, nursing is uh, about half, uh, a little less than half of ours, and then co we come. Oh, no, I'm sorry, um, uh, complementary medicine is also low, uh, lower. There is center. So, um, but uh, we're a very collaborative agency. Um, I work very closely, as you saw, with uh, National Heart, Lung, Blood. My own personal research lab is in National Heart, Lung, Blood. Um, National Institute on Aging, uh, you know, Richard Hodes is a very broad-minded, he's a basic science immunologist, uh, physician, he's actually a cancer doc, but uh, he's a terrific uh, leader and director. And, uh, and NIA has a behavioral social science program that's quite robust. Uh, and so, and cancer too, they have a big division of cancer prevention um, and epidemiology. So uh, the big institutes in general are very uh, uh, broad in their spectrum. Um, and then you have uh, National Institute of General Medical Sciences, which is uh, diversity there is physics or chemistry or biology, but um, they're very focused on training and on, uh, and on uh, the uh, under-resourced uh, institutions and states. So we partner on a number of uh, programs as well. So. Well, thank you again, um, and uh, for a wonderful presentation. There was lots of chatter um, in the questions. Uh, gracias was uh, uh, mentioned several times. So great. Well, I'll see some of you hopefully at one at uh, well, your twelve. My my. Oh. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank you again. Bye -bye. Thanks.